Hello and welcome to another Comedian's Interview for my blog and podcast, A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 1,000 comedians over the last 47 years. I'm delighted to welcome my special guest today. It's Mr. Ian Stone. Yes! Hello, mate. How are you? Thank you. I'm all right. I'm good. Thank you. I love the intro. Oh, I love the, uh, it's a pleasure. Everything. It's a nice touch. It's lovely. Well, it's well, it's great to see you, and thank you so much for doing this. I'm 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 delighted you're here as a guest. Oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, you know, we I've come, I've turned up at gigs, and there you are. And you <laughs> love your comedy, and you've been really nice about me and and about the comedy circuit generally. Yeah, Not just the circuit, actually, just comedy generally, and it's uh, and so you asked. I thought, of course, I'll do it. Of course, because you've been. You know, like I say, you, it's it's not just about me. You've been, you like what I do, but you like a lot of comedian stuff, and that's great. It's nice to have that level of support. It is brilliant, my friend. That's that's wonderful. Well, well, as I say, we're going to chat for about forty five minutes to an hour about your yeah. comedy career, and let's go right back to the start and tell me, please, how did you become a comedian in the first place? <laughs> um, my missus um, <laughs> said to me when we first met. Uh, and this was seven years before I became a comedian. She said to me, you should be a comedian. Um, and I thought, and at the time I thought, you've got to be joking. Uh, uh, that's not a joke. I actually thought this is ridiculous. Why would you say that? But there was also a bit of me that thought, well, no one's ever said anything like that to me before. So I was um, intrigued by both her and the idea Um I, I, I absolutely wasn't ready to be a comedian at that point. And um, so I carried on doing my job, which was uh, I was a, a sort of engineering. I was a consultant engineer. Right, right. I used to design heating and ventilation and air conditioning for office buildings. But yeah. I was bored. I was definitely bored. <laughs> and uh, uh, in 1989, I decided to, um, well, 1990, actually, I decided to go to India to find myself. Wow. Good so, man. Well, I, and I, I, the joke is, because everyone says to you, you're going to go to India, you're <laughs> going to find yourself, right? The joke is, you get on a plane and nine hours later, you find yourself in India, right? And, <laughs> uh, doesn't always get a laugh, to be honest, but I love that joke. I think I just love the rhythm, the rhythm of the words. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I went off, I went off uh, to India and, you know, the Far East, and when I came back seven or eight months later, I couldn't get a job. And through a series of things that I started doing, hospital, radio, a little bit of writing. I wrote for News Review at the Canal Cafe Theatre. Yeah, I know it well. And I got, and I, I got some confidence. And, um, and then my friend, Ivor Badil, David's brother, yeah. um, suggested that we write jokes together. Uh, because another comedian, Marion Pashley, was going to do some work, and <coughs> we thought we'd give it a go. And we wrote some jokes, and um, five, uh, we got uh, like five minutes together, and we didn't really know what to do with it. And I said, "I'll, I'll give it a go." <laughs> and uh, I did the Comedy Cafe on August the fourteenth, nineteen ninety-one, and uh, I was then a comedian. Well, I wasn't. Wow, was that was that your first ever gig? August 14th, 1991, they used to do a new material night at the, uh, or new act night at the Comedy Cafe in Old Street. Wow. Uh, now uh -huh. it's, uh, it's, it's, um, now I imagine it's rather expensive flats. For, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, how long, how long did you do for your first gig then? Was it just five minutes? I did five minutes. Yeah. And, um, and what was interesting is my partner who, who had initially advised me, uh, who's still my partner, incidentally, who initially advised me to do stand-up. She was in the audience, and there were two guys who were sitting in front of her, and and their comment on what I did was, um, yeah, he's a terrible performer, but the material's not bad. Oh. <laughs> well, I, 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 I disagree. <laughs> well, yes, but at the time, they were absolutely right. I, I could write a joke. I could always write a joke, but I didn't know how to sell it. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and you, and I, I must admit, I thought, okay, I can live with that. And um, 
yeah, that's how I became. That's that's how it started. Really. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. So, so your first ever gig uh, was fourteenth of August, nineteen ninety one. Yes. Yeah. Um. What What was it like when you walked out on stage? Were you terrified? Were you thinking, "I'm going to make these people laugh"? Can you remember? I was absolutely terrified. I mean, of course I was. It was mm. the comedy cafe was quite a rough gig anyway. Um, yeah. Although on a Wednesday they were a little bit more encouraging, and and the whole what happened was my my right leg started shaking. And oh my dear. Right arm started shaking. <laughs> so I put my hand, my right hand, in my pocket, and the whole right side of my body was shaking really. And I had that sort of sort of dry. Yeah, mouth, yeah. You know, Horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and there was also a strange moment about a minute in when I looked around and I thought. Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> it was a very weird moment of realization. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I didn't quite go. Why is everyone looking at me? But at the same time, there was a bit. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Looking at me. <laughs> that's that's and, uh, that's superb. Weird. That's it was a weird moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but 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 you must have thought this is great to carry on and do it, or or, or get some sort of enjoyment out of it. Not, not the first time, I'll no. be honest with you. Not the first time was really just to get through it yeah. and go, okay, that wasn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Um, the first time it really went well, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but I did a gig, five gigs in, at the uh, at the King's Head, downstairs at the King's Head. I oh, know it well, I know it well. And, um, and I went, uh, and, and Dave Schneider, David Schneider yeah. was on. Um, from uh, the day to day, and, yeah, uh, yeah, and he he did an act. He used to do this act where he would um, lasciviously peel an orange to you can leave your hat on. <laughs> very very funny, and he was a very physical guy, you know. And 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 I did my bit, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, "Oh, that was really good. What you did, that was great. I love what you did," and it blew my mind wow, I, I just wow, thought, oh wow. God, someone who i really think is funny yeah yeah is yeah. Telling me yeah that they think i'm funny and i i ran home from crouch end to finchley which is a good three miles yeah I yeah so i was flying really good man i know i know downstairs the king's head very well i i, I infamously first saw harry hill there must be right. 30 years ago and right. uh, he brushed past me he was late for the uh, um, for the for the act, he climbed on stage. He said, "He said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry, I'm late. I had to have a testicle brought down, and there was a pause, and then he said from Derby, and it was still one of the best opening lines I've ever heard to any gig. And when I when when I met him twenty five thirty years later, I told him that he said, "Oh, we I use this all the time." <laughs> great joke. Great <laughs> Very joke. funny oh, man. Harry, Very funny man. And great venue you. as well. Great venue. Yeah. No. It's Low ceiling, yeah, and, and and it used to get. It was really packed. I remember, and it was a Thursday night again. It was a new act thing, and I did five minutes. But um, yeah, I love that room. I played it a lot. So, did you continue with the five minutes? Did you go around lots of pubs and bring, invite friends along? Because because now they always have bring a friend, and I'm always the friend with the loud laugh in the front row, who's guaranteed to enjoy themselves. Uh, <laughs> you know what? You know what? I, I I did bring a few friends, but really not many. I think mm. I, I think what happened was I bought some friends to one gig and it didn't go that well. Right. And and they were looking at me like, so you you're doing this all the time? <laughs> like, why are you do, why are you putting yourself and us through this? <laughs> and so I thought I'm not inviting friends. I'm no, not I know. until I know what I'm doing. Not until I know what I'm doing. But I, I went round the open spot circuit, you know. There's, yeah. a, there's a whole circuit of these gigs. And at the time, we had Time Out, the listings magazine. Um, and and all the gigs were listed. And you could and there, and you could contact the people That's who right. were running the gigs yeah. and say, can I come and do five minutes? And they put you on and you go down. Wow. And so I, um, Brilliant. I spent the next year and a half doing the open spots, two years. Really. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, did you ever find it difficult at all to break through into comedy? Did you ever um, think this is not for me, or was there was there any confidence issues or anything like this when you were on stage? Every week, 
Including you surprised me. Last, <laughs> including last week, just to let you know. Wow, that wow. That stuff doesn't go away. It's a, it's a, it, I'm not saying it's precarious, because obviously, you know, I seem to have made a career out of it. Um, <laughs> but it sometimes feels that way. And, it, and it, it's obviously, I'm a bit more solid now in terms of my, my, my confidence. But... Oh my God! In the early days, you'd it would be horrendous sometimes, absolutely horrendous, and 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 so you just have to go. Okay, put that one down to experience. What would happen is I would come back home, and, and Rosie, my partner, would say, "Okay, so tell me what happened tonight," and I would uh, <laughs> take her through it. And we we did a lot of writing together in the first ten years. That's um, great. She was she was very much. Uh, uh, she was very significant in those early days. Yeah. In, 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 so she'd come to gigs, but she would also, um, even when even when she hadn't come, I would go home and, and we would um, we would talk through what had happened. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, invaluable, really. Brilliant. And 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 from that, did you did you did you get any nerves before you went on stage? And if so, how did you cope with them? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always you always have a few nerves before mm. you go on stage. That doesn't really go away. Mm. Um, I never drank a huge amount, so I know some people had a few pints before they went on, but I was never one of those guys. Yeah. I just, I just um, went through my stuff and paced around, and you know, went to the loo five times and, <laughs> and, and did all the things. That <laughs> I do. And um, once you were on. Is it fair to say that as soon as you had the microphone, you were away? You were you, you the, the nerves went and you were okay and you're going right. I'm going to make this audience laugh. Do you know what I? I certainly in the first couple of years, I, it was very much a sort of joke to joke thing, really. So yeah. you do a joke and they'd laugh and you think, okay, that's. I got that one worked, and then you'd think, okay, we'll do the next one and see how it goes. I, I wouldn't say I was full of confidence, but what happens is that you do have gigs which you just nail. Yeah. For whatever reason, in those first couple of years, you absolutely nail it. And if you can, and there are moments, I remember I did a gig at the Crack Comedy Club, which is a, a gig in. Um, Somewhere, Wheelstone, Harold yeah, Wheelstone. Yeah, yeah, somewhere. yeah. I did this gig at the Crack Comedy Club, and I, um, and there was a moment, I was about 50 gigs in, and there was a moment when I actually felt in control of what was going on. Actually in control of it. Only momentarily, but I genuinely, it was almost like an out-of-body experience, to be honest. I almost sort of hovered <laughs> above myself for a second going, this is okay, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> okay, I know what I'm doing. And what happens is that you you slightly move up a few levels. I was always writing jokes. I was always trying to turn stuff over. Yeah. And so and and you find a little vein of form and and um, you move up a, a gear or two. Um, but it it's a it's a slow process. And even after those sort of gigs, you still then go backwards again sometimes when it, things just don't work. So. Was there was there ever a point in your career where you thought, yes, I'm good at this and I can make a career of this? Well, a year in, um, my I got an offer of a place at a university, Portsmouth University, to do um, broadcast journalism. Right. Because I was thinking maybe I'll do some radio stuff or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And this is a year into doing stand-up. And Rosie, my partner, sort of said to me, well, do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And I, and I had to say the words, I want to be a comedian. And it, <laughs> it's no <something>, bad thing. <laughs> yeah, but, you, but to say it, to say it out loud, it, it, it sort of felt like committing. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and so a year in, I sort of committed to it. Um, but I, but I still didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. Uh, mm -hmm. That took um, about thirteen years. Wow! Probably. Wow! 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 Um, what do you like to talk about when you're on stage? Have you got any specific themes or anything like this? 
mean, I've been through different phases. I think early on I was talking more about myself. I, I, I had a long period, and it still happens when I talk, talk more about politics or current affairs. Or I mean, I was doing the Cutting Edge show yeah. for a lot of years at the yeah. Comedy Store, which was a topical, satirical show. Yeah, yeah. So I would write about what was going on in the world. Um, lately, I've been doing slightly more personal stuff, but it, it, it really depends what annoys me in any given <laughs> week. Good man. Uh, <laughs> so so I, I don't have any fixed thing. I will talk about whatever I feel like talking about. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I, I don't... You know, I don't want to limit myself going, well, I'm not that sort of comedian. I just think, mm. I'm, I'm a, I just want to say funny stuff. Yeah. Doesn't matter what it the, d- the dear old comedy store, I, I, I first went there, um, it must have been 1988. And uh, I've, been, I've been in London since 1992. My home city's Carlisle. But my brother used to live here and we used to go. And, and on that first bill, it was somebody like, it must have been, it was definitely Linda Smith. It was Richard Morton, um, John Maloney compared it, Phil Jupiter was on the bill, and top of the bill was um, Charles Fleischer. Who, oh, I saw Charles. Yeah, saw. And, and, and he vanished, didn't he? Because he went on to do to voice Roger Rabbit. He was never heard of yes. again. <laughs> yeah. I saw him, I saw him, because I used to go, before I started doing comedy, I used to go to comedy a lot. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean... <sighs> It wasn't really a gig, but the first time I ever stepped on stage was at the Comedy Store in 1979, when I was 16 years old. Wow. And my friend put me down for an open spot, and I didn't realise you could say no. So, (laughs) Tony Allen was the compere, and he said, please welcome Ian Stone. Wow. And I stood up, and I looked at my mate, and went, you bastard. (laughs) And and I went on, and I died, obviously. I did... um, I did a, what was the joke? I did uh, two lepers walking down the street. How are you? Mustn't crumble. Right? <laughs> yeah, you laugh. You're the only one who would have done it in that room, honestly. I love no gags like that. And I, and I got gonged off. But what was interesting is, when, 12 years later, I went back to do my open spot at the comedy store, and Don Ward said to me, you've been here before. And I said, oh, yeah, I used to come here a lot in the 80s to watch shows. And he goes, no, you've been on stage. And I said... Well, I did a two-minute <laughs> bit as a 16-year-old back in 1979. He said, I said, how do you remember me? He goes, the nose. He said, I remember the nose. Oh, 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 oh dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's funny. It's well, well, that um, was the first time. That was the first time. But then I went back and did my open spot in it, um, yeah. whatever it was, 1992, something like that. Well, I, had, I admire you for doing, um, to having a go at 16. I, I, I wanted it out of my system a few years back. Um, I, I've, as I said, I've been supporting comedy for over 40 years, and I thought, I, I, thought, I think I can have a go. So yeah. I knew a promoter, and he, and he said, yeah, yeah, go on. He said, he said um, there's a, there's a um, gong show, which is for old people. It couldn't be worse. <laughs> And I and I walked out, and um, uh, my opening line was, um, "Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. People think I look like Eddie the Eagle Edwards, but I can't see the resemblance myself. And of course, I'm his double." One old bloke at the back just went, "Fuck off!" and cut me off, wow. and that was it. Wow. And I thought, "Hmm." <laughs> and wow. another go, and <laughs> same thing yeah. happened. And I, not a very encouraging. No. <laughs> I said, I said to the promoter, I think my uh, 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 destiny lies in the sitting in the audience supporting them all. God bless them. Never say never again. But um, yeah, you know. Um, uh, do you have a technique for dealing with difficult audiences? I mean, I, I don't think it's a technique. I think, I mean, I just try and get them to laugh. I mean, yeah. what, what, get them on your side, what, I think, is the key, isn't it? Well, it, uh, to be honest, it's not even about getting them on my side. It's I don't really care if they like me or not. <laughs> I'd like them to. I, I have this thing that I, I call it passionate indifference, right? That I care deeply about what I do, but yeah. I couldn't give a shit whether audiences like it or not. It's not, <laughs> that, I, it's not that I don't want them to laugh, but... 
to a certain extent, they have to come to me. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. And, and I genuinely, there are moments when I do a joke and it doesn't get what I, what I think it deserves. And I will tell them <laughs> that they are. And because, you know, you know, I sort of know that I can do this now. And it's yeah. amazing that I still qualify it, to be honest. I sort of know, right? but I do sort of know that I can do it. So I'm slightly shocked when they don't go for it. And I, I suppose I use a mixture of carrot and stick, really, uh, like like anyone. Sometimes I tickle them a little bit and I try and, and I try and be nice. And sometimes I slap them about. And it, rather depends, it rather depends on what they're like and what mood I'm in, really. Good man. Well, well, please keep doing what you do because it's very, very funny. Um, how do you remember all your routines? Do you have a way of remembering them? Do you write notes down or things like that? I used to write them all down. I used to write them word for word. I used to have them word for word, including uh, pauses, which would be dot, 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 dot on the script. And then the punchline would be underlined. And <laughs> what I would do is I'd look through the script, and if there was more than about four lines between an underlined bit where I expected a laugh to be, I would see if I could tighten it up a little bit just so I had a good gag rate, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like, I like a gag, you know? I'm yeah. not... Um, so that's what I used to do. Um, now, I don't really write it down at all, to be honest. I just... I mean, I don't have a set order. I don't have anything in my head when I go on. Wow. Um, I just, I just go on and start talking um, and see what happens. I've That's got wonderful. enough back catalogue. I've got enough back catalogue and I've got enough thoughts in my head. Um, but I will have. I'll, I'll ask some idea of the sort of thing I might want to talk about. But if the if the audience, if something happens and I end up going in a different direction, it doesn't bother me. I I, I, I quite enjoy. I really enjoy messing around. Yeah, yeah, honest. yeah. The the uh, the reason I asked the question is that um, other than this blog, the most creative thing I've ever done is uh, write a play, and uh, may right. may 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 make put it on for comic relief, and it's called the applicant, and we got uh, quite a lot of money in. We did three shows. And it's basically about me coming down to London from Carlisle and I've got a successful girlfriend who's got a, a very successful job and I've never had an interview. So each scene was um, waiting room, interview, waiting room, interview, and he gets more and more confident as he goes along. Yeah. So because I'm sitting in the waiting room, there's nobody there and I start chatting to the audience, so I'm doing monologues. And I'm suddenly writing these pages to try and set the, the scene up. When I ran out on the first night after 10 weeks of rehearsing this thing, I was like a rabbit in headlights and I forgot the monologue and I wrote the bloody thing. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I was going to ask you, is it a similar thing with stand-up comedy as opposed to acting? Or um, I suppose you can banter with the audience and it make it seem seamless. Yeah, in terms of like remembering what you're going to say. Yeah. Certainly in the early days. Um, yeah, I mean, I did use a certain some techniques. Like, you, I'd rehearse it by saying it all at double speed. Um, so you know, I I would I would rehearse it where I'd say the end of one routine and the beginning of the next routine, so that I'd it would naturally happen when I was on stage. Here's the punchline, and then I'm talking about this next thing, and, and it would, so I would bounce off one into yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which are more acting techniques, really. But that was back when I wrote it down and had some sort of set list, whereas yeah. now I don't. I mean, I'm going to do a show in Edinburgh this year, and, I, and that will be a bit more structured, but certainly the stuff I do in clubs is not structured at all. Right, right, right. Let's let's move on to Edinburgh itself. I'm I'm very lucky to be able to go to the Edinburgh Fringe every year. It's my it's my holiday. I haven't been for the last two years for obvious reasons. But the first fringe I went to was twenty oh five. And I go up for a week and I see about fifty shows and I, I can't get enough of it. I, I, I just love it. I need a holiday by the time I come back because I'm so shattered. Please tell me about your first Edinburgh Fringe, and what was it like? Um, first 
Edinburgh Fringe was uh, 1996. So it was essentially the best hour I had up to that point. Um, I can't remember the... Um, Oh, was it the cheek? It was the cheek of Ian Stone, is what it was. And, <laughs> Great uh, title. <laughs> yeah, and it was. It was a really. It was a good show actually as well. And and um, I was in the wee room at the Gilded Balloon. Yeah. Not the one that there's there's now. This is the one that burnt down a few right. years ago. Yeah. And um, and I did really well. I had a really good Edinburgh. I um, I got some good reviews. And we managed to get people in. I was leafleting my own show. Brilliant. And, uh, and, it, and yeah, we sold out the last two weeks. And it was a lot of fun. Although I did the, the best show of the entire run one night. And then I went to Late and Live and died so badly. Oh, mate. Oh, oh. Badly. But, you know, uh, it's how it goes. But um, I had a really good time that year. And so stayed in a flat, stayed in a flat with... Uh, Dave Johns and yeah. John Fothergill and Sean Locke. Oh, God also. bless him, yeah. God bless him, yeah. And um, we had a brilliant time, a brilliant time. And this is back in the day when you could get some accommodation in Edinburgh for less than about five grand a week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, brilliant, uh, brilliant. It was, uh, it was great. And, I, and I, I'd i been up, I went up um, very early on, actually. I went up. So I did my first gig in, at the Comedy Cafe, 14th of August, 1991, and then I went to Edinburgh just to have a look around, and I did a couple of gigs up there just to see. I'd never been before. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, I didn't even know about it up to the point where I started doing stand-up. It's not something that working-class kids really... Yeah. I, I, I mean, I just didn't really have a clue about it. Yeah. You know, I didn't know anyone who'd been. I didn't know what it was. So I'd been up a couple of times to have a look by the time I took a show up there. And uh, and we had a great time. We had a really, really Brilliant. good time. Um, and, uh, you, I, I was the first show you ever did, was that an hour long one? You were straight into yeah. the hour long. Yeah, I did an hour show. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, because I, I, I've, always, I've always turned over material. Yeah. So I, I do like to write new stuff, I feel. Especially as I'm doing topical stuff, it obviously gets old pretty quickly. Yeah, and so uh, you write new stuff, and and um, yeah, I enjoyed myself that year. That Good was man. A fun year. Have you have you done hour long shows since then? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did ninety six, ninety seven, two thousand, and then two thousand and six, seven, and eight. Wow, is the, is the six shows I've done. Brilliant. And I'm going back this year for the first time in fourteen years. Well, I will be there, my friend. I'm coming to see God, you, and we'll have a beer. God help me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me give you get start that again. Let me give you the rundown of the list that I've seen you perform. You've been I've seen you at the Edinburgh Fringe in 2007 and 2008, the Ballam yeah. Comedy Festival in 2013, and the Ealing Comedy Festival in 2016 as well as the Comedy Store in 2019 and Headliners Comedy Club in 2021. Yeah. Every time hilarious, may I say. Congratulations. Thanks, Please describe your writing process, if you've got one, and where you get your ideas from. Um, I, I don't really have a writing process for stand-up no. at this point. I mean, I mean, essentially what happens is I'll see something on the telly or I'll have a thought Something will probably piss me off. That's <laughs> and it sort of begins from there. Um, and I'll, what will happen is I'll, I'll have a phrase in my head or something, a thought in my head, which I'll sort of, it'll just sort of go round and round and round in my head. And I'll walk around the house saying it. And, I'll, and, and at, at some point, other stuff will come out and it will become a thing, you know? Brilliant. Um, I mean, I remember, I remember watching, um, watching some news. This may be four or five years ago about Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. And there were some issues with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and somebody said to this this Labour supporter on the news, um, "Is it fair to say that Jeremy only likes the right sort of Jews?" I think they asked him. And this guy said, 
I do not want to get into a game of good Jew, bad Jew, right Jew, wrong Jew, is what he'd said. Wow. And I spent about the next month walking around the house going, good Jew, bad Jew, right Jew, wrong Jew. <laughs> and, ending up, and ending up inventing a whole game where people would shout out Jews and we'd decide what sort of Jew they were. Right? It was <laughs> funny. And, and it came from that moment. That's brilliant. That moment. But it, I, I mean... I wouldn't even call it a writing process. It's a thinking process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I'm thinking it, and then I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm picking at it, and and seeing if something, if I can come up with a little diversion within that story, whatever that happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and then suddenly, if you work at it, you find yourself you've got five minutes, and you know you only need ten or twelve of them, and you've got a show. Brilliant, brilliant. That's a great answer. Um, You've also written a book about one of my favourite bands, The Jam. Yeah. I was intrigued by this. It's entitled, it's entitled To Be Someone. And you also do a lot of after-dinner speaking as well. Yeah. Um, how did these come about, and do you approach these writing styles as opposed to creating standard routines? Is there a difference in approaching the styles? Well, books, books are completely different because you are writing. I mean, you are... I mean, it, I mean, with the book, this was my partner's, this was Rose's idea as well. Pretty much everything in my career is her idea. <laughs> and and, and um, she said to me, why don't you write a book about the jam? Because I was a huge jam fan and um, still am. And uh, I, I wish it'd reform. <laughs> well, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I saw the documentary, the documentary yeah. um, a few years ago. That's sort of how it started. And in the documentary, they asked Bruce and Rick, you know, the uh, the bassist and the drummer, what do you think? And they went, oh, yeah, maybe. And Paul Weller was asked, and he went, no fucking... <laughs> and, and it was so unequivocal. And the truth is, he was right. As much yeah. as I would like yeah, to see yeah. them, and I'd spend enormous amounts of money to go to that gig, yeah. I, I don't need to see them sing when you're young. No, you know, no. <laughs> It seems a little ridiculous. So, but what happened was um, she'd suggested that maybe I write a book. And and the two guys that I used to go to jam gigs with when we were 14, 15, 16, Simon and Warren, who are still friends of mine. And Simon, I see a lot. He lives up the road and I write stuff with him. But that's another thing. Um, we went to the exhibition at Somerset House. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it was all the old memorabilia and what have you. And we had dinner afterwards and we talked about those days. And I thought, you know what? I think I could. I think I could do this. So I, I, I put together a proposal, got an agent, pitched it. And we managed to get Unbound, the crowdfunding. Um, oh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. You can raise the money. We'll, we'll let you write the book. And I managed to raise the money. Um, I'm lucky in the sense that I know a lot of people. And yeah. I'm, and, and with something like that, you have to sort of, people are not giving you, they're not giving you money. They're, they're, they're basically buying the book in advance of you writing it. That's the point. And as long as it feels like it's the right project for you, people are enthusiastic. And, and when I asked people about this and told them what it was about, they thought, yeah, yeah, Stanley could could do that, and they gave me money, and and I raised the money and wrote the book, and got Brilliant. Phil Jupiter's, Phil Jupiter's did the illustrations, and yeah. they're utterly beautiful. They're, yeah. they're really works of art. And um, oh no, it's a, it's a, you know what, it is a big achievement writing a book, and I'm proud that I've managed to do it. Good and man. Another one. Um, no, it's a it's a cool thing to be published. You yeah, know? yeah. I, mean, I, didn't read, I didn't read a book till I was about 19 or 20. So to have written one is quite something. That's fantastic. The, the blog started out life as a book, and I still right. have a script for it, uh, but it, there's about a 1,000 pages that I've written. And I might have a look at um, Unbound because crowdfunding seems to be the way to go with it. It, it, um, uh, it was going to cost me an arm and a leg to get it done through a publisher, so I, so I put everything on the blog. But... Um, I'm like you. I would love to see something in print of my own. You know, I think I no, think it's, it's, it's great what you've done. It's a real buzz. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, and it and it's unlike obviously anything else in that 
you know, I, if I write a joke or come up with a joke, I, I can go on stage later on that evening and tell it. Yeah. And people will laugh and you think, beautiful, instant gratification. Whereas a book, you're not getting it for three years yeah, yeah. from when you write the joke. But then you get all these messages going, you know, and I still get them. Like um, people contact me on social media or through the website saying, read your book, loved it. And, and I, I sell them at gigs. I sell them after gigs now. And, Fantastic. Uh, and it's a lovely thing. And I get to meet people. And, and um, no, I'm dead chuffed I've done it. Of they were um, my... And it looked beautiful as well. I'm good for you. Them. Good man. Uh, um, my, my brother was a punk. He was 16 and I was 10. And then the jam followed them straight away about 1977. And I got all the vinyl loved them and they were the first band I ever saw on their last tour Carlisle Market Hall in 1983 and my brother was a roadie for them it was incredible um, how cool yeah how cool yeah I just saw the them, best I saw them 32 times wow <laughs> I was I was, uh, I was obsessed obsessed from when I I heard I mean really Although the book is about the jam, the book really is about music. And yeah, about yeah. When you're 13 or 14 years old, <laughs> even younger maybe, and you hear a bit of music that hits you on the side of the head, mm. and it, you just go, what? Mm. I've never heard. And that was in the city for me, oh, hearing yeah, that yeah. on John Peel's radio show. Yeah, yeah. We used, we, we used to listen to John Peel every night and hear all these amazing bands coming up. And that's, and that's what started it for me and I and I loved going to live music and I still do. Start so am I I'm 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 a big scar fan. I love madness and uh, the specials and all that sort of thing and and they've got lots of memories for me as well but um my favorite jam album is um Setting Suns and my favorite song Sat These Kids. I absolutely love that. It just relates to me being in Carlisle. It's weird. Drive Cortina's fur trim dashboard. Yeah. <laughs> My dad had one. <laughs> I mean, that's how much I love him. I can quote lyrics. Fantastic. Yeah. Have, have, have you seen From the Jam? You go and see them. No, no, yeah. I haven't. I mean, a mate of mine, is, that mate I told you about, Warren, he does ask me once in a while. I never have. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not that bothered about, about it, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm told they're great. I've seen Weller a few times. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, it's weird. I've sort of got to know him a little bit through the book because he yeah. gave me a quote for the front cover. Right, yes. Because a mutual friend of ours got the book to him, the, an early draft of the book, and he phoned me up. Um, <laughs> he phoned me. He just, I picked up the phone and like, a number came up. I thought, I don't know who that is. And I went, hello. And he went, hello, Ian. It's Paul Weller. And I wow. wanted to go. <laughs> I wanted to go, I know. Of course I know. I've heard your voice a million times. But I went, oh, hi, Paul. How are you? Like, it's the most <laughs> thing in the world. And he said to me, I really like the book. I'd forgotten how shit it was in the 70s. And I said, can I use that as a quote on the front cover? And he said, yes, and it's on the front cover. Brilliant. And I've met him. I've met him a couple of times for, for a bite to eat. And it's... Um, amazing you know, that's awesome. fantastic what a what an achievement that is for you i'm, I'm delighted for you um, thanks tell me a bit about the after dinner speaking you have to hone your audience you have to prepare that more as opposed to do a standard I mean, game there, there are certain jokes that i would do in a club that i just would not do uh, right. at an after dinner gig because you just have to you have to be a bit more careful it's a work event as opposed to people on a night out sure you know? yeah um and I and I I try and do a bit of research into what the company does and you know who the people are because in the end, the secret with corporates and after dinners is that you, they need to know the audience need to know that you know where you are and mm. you're not just trotting out a regular set, and once you've established that you know where you are, I know this is the Cast Metal Federation annual awards to <laughs> and. Christ, I've loved cast metal since I was a kid or whatever. <laughs> you know. Once you've done that, then you can do your regular stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you know that thing you were asking me before about the techniques for, yeah. for dealing with an audience? You have to use them a little bit more at after dinners, mm, basically. Mm, mm. Um, but you know what? I mean, I did I did one a few months ago, and I was and I and I I, uh, I worked with Gareth Southgate, and it was absolutely fantastic. Wow. You know how much I love my football. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And um, 
you know, I ended up having lunch with Gareth Southgate and, and doing a gig. Wow. And we had a great time. And, and, you know, it's a nice thing to yeah. have that. Yeah, it's a yeah. really nice thing. Yes. And, and I've got a lovely photo with him. Brilliant, and, uh, brilliant. That's so, great. You know, it's lovely. It's That's lovely. superb. So, um, so I do I do them, and, and, I, and I don't mind doing them. Also, because I think I'm of an age now where I'm not intimidated by a load of men in dinner suits like I might have used to have been. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm the same age as them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> um, talking about football, you also present Footballs On for BT Sport and other television appearances. You've appeared on Mock the Week on BBC Two as well as the radio shows, the now show and political animal for Radio 4. Do you prepare differently for TV and radio as opposed to stand-up? Is there set rules or guidelines or whatever? Well, the TV show, uh, the, the football's on TV show. We used to do it in the TV studio. So it was a regular TV studio show. So we'd have a script, I'd have yeah. auto cue, we'd have makeup and all that faff and palaver. <laughs> and then, and then you do the stuff you do the stuff you've written down the barrel um down the camera and then you chat and try and make people relaxed and uh um i i love doing it yeah. i mean i mean the, the last few years of the football's on we've been doing it from home for obvious reasons uh so i just set up a little tv studio in the back bedroom and, uh, and do no and um it's great we get to talk shit about football for an hour with mates <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, honestly, honestly, Richard, if you'd have said to me when I was a kid, you're going to write a book and end up being friends with Paul Weller <laughs> and you're going to present a TV show about football, <laughs> I'd have just gone, you're mad. <laughs> Why would that happen? So, so you know, I, I do, I do realise how lucky I am. You know, I did a radio show with Ian Wright for five years on That's Absolute incredible. Radio. And that's incredible. He's a hero of mine, That's right? Incredible. I absolutely love writing. And now I saw him a few months ago and he's stony and I'm like, righty, <laughs> and we're mates and it it's it blows my mind. It's and so I, good. I think, I think you have to you have to maintain an appreciation of the incredibly lucky position that you're in. Oh yeah. Job. Yeah. Well I mean And I I think I have. I'd like to yeah. think I have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, my blog is case in point. All I do is go and laugh at comedians, and it, it's really taking off. It's 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 an extraordinary archive that I'm no, doing, and which is and great. It's, and it's and it's something that you love. Yeah. I think if you're if you're involved in anything that to do uh, doing anything which something that you love. Yeah. It's not work, is it? It's just it's pleasure. Then it's it? it's just the best. My my team, of course, are Carlisle United who have just signed Paul Simpson as their manager. And I used to go to school with Paul Simpson in oh, Carlisle, which is extraordinary. Um, just Carlisle a weird... United. Carlisle United is... I've been to Carlisle United. I went... I made a radio show for Radio 4 called Football's Loyal Fans. And we basically <laughs> went... What, it was in, when they were in League One. That's... Wolverhampton Wanderers were in League One. And yeah. we, got a, we got a coach... All the way up the motorway to Carlisle on a Tuesday night. Lovely. Um, it's really crazy. And I, what I remember is the stand extends twenty feet beyond the end of the pitch. <laughs> That's right. To move the pitch. It's very funny. Um, That's right. But yes. yes. <clears throat> and um, just recently, um, fellow comedian who's done the who's done uh, one of these podcasts. Kevin Day did did his his podcast at AFC Wimbledon. I'm based in Southfields, and a friend of mine got me tickets um, to go and see his podcast with Kieran Maguire, The Price right. of Football, and, oh, that, yes. and and that was fascinating because um, you know to have another interest other than the comedy was was wonderful to see, and it's and I can see with you how passionate you are about it. It's great, yeah, really yeah. good. Um, so let's move on. Who are your favourite comedians, past and present? Did you grow up with um, comedy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I loved Laurel and Hardy as a kid. Oh, loved man. Laurel and Hardy. I mean, I still do, really. They don't show the films, but I still enjoy them. The first stand-up I really liked was a guy called Ken Goodwin. Oh, he's brilliant. He old, he's... old school northern comic. Brilliant. Uh, and I and I joined the Ken Goodwin fan club. 
Wow. Um, when I was about eight or nine. He was really the first stand-up I got into. Wow. And then, it, then it was Les Dawson. Yeah. Um, I love watching Les. I thought he was amazing. Yeah. Was so funny. Uh, I remember seeing the good old days and him being so good. I loved all that. He's so well, brilliant. That would have been, that would have been mid-70s, probably. Yeah. Then... Um, Connolly, I saw, I remember seeing Connolly on um, on Parkinson, and that, that yeah. was one of those moments. Of yeah. all joined in the nation. Morecambe and Wise, of course, and the two Ronnies later on. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the stand-ups, you know, I'm, I mean, I've got to work with Bill Bailey, and I've got to work with Sean Locke, and I've got to work with I don't know, there's so many Daniel Kitson, yeah. who not many people know, but I just think oh, he's superb. Genius. Genius, and and so I, I'm so lucky to know all these people and to work with them, and and and. Yeah. Well, it's deserved as well, mate, because you are a great comedian. There's no denying it. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I feel like I know what I'm doing, and people, are, people, hey, listen, I've got away with it this long. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I know. I got. I've got some game. I guess. <laughs> The first, the first gig I ever saw was a family holiday. It was Les Dawson in Scarborough, and he was amazing, 1977. And I have a running argument with my brother. I was convinced it was my grandma. She, was, she, she came in late for the show, and she had to go underneath the wing, the front stage where he was. He collared her out the corner of his eye, and he, and, and he took the mickey out of her for the rest of the show came on, did the encore, and he said, he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're very privileged tonight to have the chairwoman of the Scarborough Women's Institute in the audience tonight. She's 111 years old today. Today's her birthday. My grandma <laughs> went purple. Everybody in the crowd went, happy birthday. To, he's on the piano playing it badly, and just perfectly, he looked round, he went, what, what, oh. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, she's not 111, she's ill. She's Ill. And the curtain jumped down. Love that he joke. was genius. Love that joke. He I used genius. to do that joke for a while. I did that <laughs> joke. Um, I did that joke because I used to do a routine about working for hospital radio. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> this one's for Ethel, who is 111. Oh, no, she's ill. That joke, he was, oh, he my was, God, he, how brilliant. He's yeah, in, well, He's yeah. in my top five, definitely. I, w I would say... No, he's amazing. He's amazing. Oh, he was. I, w I, w I would say Morecambe and Wise, who I never got to see. That's the big regret. Um, Tommy Cooper, I saw. Les Dawson, Ken Dodd, um, Billy Connolly. I saw all of those. And just below the two, Ronnies, who I saw. Um, uh, and then into the 80s with the comedy store and everything coming up, the, the, the comedians that I watched there, with, it was just joyous. And now I go every week, you know. Um, and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and it is, you know, I mean, I remember seeing Joe Brand at the Red Rose. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing comedy a couple of years, and I went to see Joe Brand, and she blew the roof yeah. off this gig. She was so, so funny. Yeah. Alan Davis is a brilliant oh, comedian. We... I, I mean, he is a brilliant comedian. Yeah. I actually think, I think he's one of the best comedians I've ever seen. He is. Alan. He is I, super. I, I watch him and I, there's not many people I think are funnier than me and it pisses me <laughs> off. <laughs> he is. He genuinely is. He's so, so funny and I love watching him. Um, we, we saw him in a club in Manchester just as he was starting out and he did an hour and he was enjoying himself so much. He said, if anybody wants to go to the pub next door, the, the bar, please go and I'll just keep carrying on with my act. And he was chatting to four walls as fuck went to get the beer and he came back and did another half an hour. <laughs> yeah, no, he's very, <laughs> he very, was brilliant. very talented. Yeah. But, you know, even through to people now like Zoe Lyons yeah. and Kerry Godleyman. Oh, I love her. And Brister and, yeah. and like, there's so many... People that I work with regularly, Mick Ferry's yeah, funny, super. really proper, yeah, funny. Yeah. Fothergill, when he's on his yeah. game, is great. They, so uh, there's hundreds of people who I really, really like, yeah. and and I like working with them, and I like that they're friends of mine. Brilliant. Following on from that, um, and I think you, we've already touched on this. Like me, do you go to a lot of comedy gigs as a member of the audience? No, no, I don't actually. I don't. I'm not. I mean, I, 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 I've been the last comedy gig I went to was Bill Bailey in a theatre about three years ago, and and I'll make an exception for Bill because I just think he's genius. He is. He's you know. brilliant. 
maybe 45 minutes have been hilarious and then he'll pick up one of the 100 instruments he can play yeah. and he's incredible um, but I don't really uh, go no. I don't watch a lot of comedy um, I guess it, maybe it's a bit of a busman's holiday but um, I also get a bit fidgety at gigs as well yeah, um, yeah. I mean I'll watch the other acts when I'm on if I'm doing a gig and I'm not going anywhere else I will watch the other yeah. acts yeah that was uh, what I was going to ask you next yeah. especially if I haven't if I haven't seen them before yeah but, um, no, I don't go to gigs to watch comedy. Not really. No. I, f I first saw um, Bill Bailey in the Rubber Bishops at the Comedy yeah, cool. Store, and you could tell there he was amazing, and I've seen him yeah. many, many yeah. times. He's a, he's a wonderfully funny, really good bloke as well. You know, he's just yeah, he's, he's intelligent and clever, yeah. and it's great. Um how have you found online gigs as opposed to live stand-up? Have you done many of them? Did you do many of them in lockdown? Did two or three. Yeah. Um, and I didn't. I did. I think I did a. I think I compared a gong show. Right. Uh, at the comedy store online, and that was okay. Yeah. Um, but really, I'd rather eat my own leg. <laughs> That's a wonderful I mean, really, answer. I just, I just can't. I, I just, I don't know. It, I just found it the whole thing weird. Yeah, weird. it is and odd. I, you're all, I, you're I, all right here. This is different. I'm chatting. I'm chatting here. This is fine. But an actual gig. Yeah. I did. I did a few, and they were okay. Yeah. But it's it's um, I remember once doing a a, a gig at the comedy store, um, and and. There was a guy called Vic Henley who's since passed away, uh, American comic, and Dave Johns were in the back. Yeah. And I came off stage and they said, how was it? And I said, I did a good impression of, of a comedian, right? I did, I, was, I did an impression of someone being funny and they both fell about laughing. But essentially, that's what an online gig feels like to me. It feels like a facsimile of a gig. It feels... That's really interesting. When, it doesn't feel like I don't get that connection that you no, do when you're in a room. Yeah, yeah. When when they're my view is is when they're done well, they were they were very very good. So you know, it, uh, in lockdown they were ideal because folk who couldn't get to them could go and everything. But the first month or so. They never had any audio on them. So here I was right. laughing at four walls. I thought I was going to be taken away. You know, it was well, like... No. Imagine, <laughs> imagine talking down the microphone and, <laughs> and nothing, and nothing. Or seeing someone wander off into the bathroom <laughs> while you're talking. I mean, the whole thing... It, listen, it, lockdown was soul-destroying in yeah. any number of ways. Yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'm not saying I hated them. I just say just I, for I, you. I really would rather not do them ever again. No, no. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I am with you. You cannot beat live. I mean, I love to no. go out on a Saturday night, have a few drinks, and then sit down. Because it's of its moment, a live yeah. comedy gig. You never know what magical, you're going to get. Magical stuff yeah. can happen. Yeah, can yeah. Happen. And that's the beauty of it. You know, I, I once I was once at the comedy store and there were this couple. Um, I mean, there's no easy. They were basically quite overweight, the pair of them. Right. And they sat and they always used to come along. And I remember going into the dressing room or coming out of the dressing room just before the start of the show. And they were there in the corner and they waved at me and I waved back because I'd seen them there. They always sat in the same seat. And um, and then I went on. I was doing the gig and I said something. um I said, I think I said something about um, if somebody told you do not come round for dinner, right? I think the punchline was you you wouldn't go round for dinner. And I looked at the big fat guy and I said, well, you probably might pop round for dinner. Right? <laughs> Everyone, laughed. Everyone laughed. And then um, um, and then he uh, he heckled. I, I said to him, what do you do for a living? And he goes, I'm a cake taster, right? And everyone laughed. And I went, okay. okay. That's one one, right? That's an equalizer there. Um, we need um, uh, uh, we need to we need to get a, maybe do a penalty shootout. And then I said, yeah. well, maybe we'll, I said maybe we'll have a race. Maybe we'll have a race, and everyone laughed. And his wife looked at me and went, "You'd win by a nose." Right? <laughs> a brilliant, brilliant heckle. And I and and then she sort of looked up at me from the front row, going, "Please don't hurt me, please." Right? And I mean, 
I said, oh man, that's just a brilliant moment. I said, sometimes you've got to take it on the chin, right? <laughs> and in my head, I thought, or in your case, chins, but I didn't say that. There's no need. There's no need. But what was beautiful about it was that it was it it, it would never happen again. No, moment. no, it's of its time. Right? Yeah. I passed Marcus Brigstock. I think I think he was comparing or I was comparing, whatever, we passed. And he said to me, That was brilliant. And I said, Yeah, it was, it was, it was brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> and we both knew that we'd seen something that will never happen again. You That's fantastic. That. What a you can't get that online. You no. can only get that in a room. Yeah. You can only get that in a room. I'm not saying Good stuff doesn't happen online, but live is where it's at. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, 100%. And thank God all the comedy clubs are opening up and everything and, yeah. and things getting back to normal. I've so enjoyed this chat. You've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much. Um, just before we go, is there anything else you'd like to say? Have you got any gigs coming up? Are you on tour? Have you got any podcasts? Where can people find you on social media? That sort of thing. Yeah, um, well, I'm, uh, I, I, I present the football zone on BT Sport. You can watch that on Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of go, we go, we have little little series of six and then we're off for a few weeks and then we're back on. Um, you can find me on Twitter mainly at Ian D. Stone, D for David. And um, yeah, buy the book if you fancy uh, to be someone. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna get it, my friend. When I saw it on the website, I thought, "Wow, that's that's fantastic." And I, for one, am gonna be it first in the queue at your Edinburgh show. I'm delighted you're going to do it again, and hope to see you before then live. Well, I'm at the Counting House in uh, it's Free Fringe, so wow. that'll be interesting for me. I'm quite looking forward to doing it, and we'll see how it goes. But it's my first time in 14 years. It's called Ian Stone, Writer of Wrong. Brilliant. Uh, as in R I G H T E R. Right <laughs> of course. And, uh, <laughs> and um, we'll see how it goes, but I'm excited. I am excited. I haven't been up for a long time, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Good man. Well, well, if I don't see you there, I'll definitely see you before. And all the very best to you. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me.